right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as I said earlier, my name is Nikki, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, today is North Shore Pediatric Therapies webinar on overcoming learning disabilities in 2020, as presented by two of our esteemed neuropsychologists, Dr. Greg Stacy and Dr. Alexandra Isaacs. Today, they're going to be going over different types of learning disabilities, what types of uh, treatments are available, what types of options you have in your school system in order to get your kid the help that they need, and how uh, learning disabilities affect e-learning. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it off to Dr. Greg Stacy. Thank you. Okay. So when we're talking about learning disabilities, the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and it's the guidebook uh, published by American Psychiatric Association, indicates that there are three types of learning disabilities that a child might have. And we're going to briefly cover each one of those. Uh, specific learning disability of impairment in reading, learning disability of impairment in mathematics, and a learning disability of impairment in written expression. So what the DSM defines as a specific learning disability with impairment in reading is if um, a child or a person is presenting with deficits in either word reading accuracy, reading rate or fluency, and reading comprehension. A lot of times we have parents talking about that they think their child has dyslexia. Dyslexia is not a specific diagnosis in the DSM-5, but it's a cluster of symptoms that we see. And what it is, is a pattern of difficulties with accurate or fluent word recognition. So the child struggles with being able to sound out novel words that they have never been uh, exposed to. Poor decoding, so the phonemic awareness is weak. You'll often say the child faking it. They'll say a word that resembles the word that's presented to them based on their memory, but they really cannot decode it effectively. And with that, we often have poor spelling abilities. Um, Letter reversals, that's often what we see in TV, that the child makes letter reversals. That happens, but it's not the hallmark feature of dyslexia. The really hallmark feature is the decoding component and sounding out novel words. Um, so out of the three um, learning disabilities, reading disorders are the ones that are most prevalent. Uh, they have a prevalence rate that ranges from 5 to 15% of the general pop population. Um, there are some genetic basis for reading disabilities, which is why it, we can see it happen in families. Um, and then there's acquired reading disorders as well that can um, be attributed to either medical or um, medical causes like traumatic brain injuries. 70% um, of individual differences are attributed to genetics. Uh, and something that we know about uh, reading disorders is that good readers read more outside of school. With reading, we always want to make sure that we assess it at the four levels of reading. So when we're breaking down how an individual reads, it's going to be the phonemic analysis. So that's going to be decoding, right? Seeing a novel word, being able to sound it out. Word identification that obviously we know that some uh, words are just sight words that we just have to memorize them, that they cannot phonetically sound them out. Reading fluency. So how fast a child puts words together to make sentences, to make paragraphs, and then their comprehension of the information. And we always want to look at all stages of it because that's going to kind of guide how do we intervene? Um, for example, if a child really struggles with the phonemic analysis and the word identification, we could pretty much guarantee that the reading fluency is going to be slow. Uh, they're putting a lot of effort into being able to decode the information, uh, sound it out. So it's going to take a while for them to read. And because they're not a fluent reader, by the time they get to the end of the passage, their comprehension is going to be weak as well. Um, but that doesn't really tell me that their true comprehension is weak. So what we want to do then is do a task where we read to them a passage and see, do they understand it? Because uh, if, if we can read to them, they understand it. That tells us then that the comprehension is okay, that we really want to target the phonemic awareness and the word identification, which will then help out with the fluency. Uh, transitioning to a specific learning disability with impairment in mathematics, uh, the, di the DSM identifies four different areas in which we can see difficulties. Um, one of them is number sense, which is just the ability to know that a number is associated with a quantity, so that one cow is number one, two cows is two. Uh, another area of difficulty that we see people with, uh, impairment in, with a learning disability and impairment in math is memorization of arithmetic facts, so knowing that two plus two is four, or that one plus one is two. Um, fluency is a concept that we can apply to also um, math as well as reading. And again, this is more about 
accuracy and the ability to do it at an average rate. So does it take a child or a person five minutes to figure out that two plus two is four or is it something that can come automatically to them? And the last piece is math reasoning, which is really being able to apply concepts um, to kinds of everyday situations, which we'll see uh, and can assess in work problems. Dyscalculia, just like dyslexia, it's not an official DSM diagnosis, but again, it's a cluster of symptoms that we see. It's pattern of difficulties characterized by processing numerical information. So the um, child has difficulty just with getting number sense, learning arithmetic facts that uh, the parent may drill and kill flashcards with the child and just can't seem to memorize the information. And then performing accurate or fluent calculations that it just takes a while for the child to kind of process and complete the work at a fast rate. So just some information about learning disabilities with impairment in math. Um, the prevalence is anywhere from three to 14%. This is um, one of the disabilities, learning disabilities that we don't know a whole lot about, but we do know that there are certain skills involved. Um, one of them is visual spatial skills. And um, this is part of math because it helps people align numbers and columns. Um, visual spatial skills also helps us understand a geometry. Uh, there's also linguistic abilities that are involved in math, uh, particularly in solving word problems. And then in working memory, which is really the ability to hold something in your mind and manipulate it in a certain way. So if I were to tell you, um, yeah, if I were to tell you, you know, if Johnny had two apples and Susie had four, if you, how many apples do they have all together, you're, you're using your working memory skills by, by figuring out that answer. So the epidemiology of math is fancy, where, where does it come from, right? Uh, there's a genetic predisposition that we know two chromosomes are implicated, it's not important, but we know that there's a, usually a familial link. Uh, if a parent has a math disorder, there's a good chance a child might. Uh, we also know that mathematics disorder is often comorbid, so it's coexisting with the diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, studies have shown that anywhere between 14 to 40% of uh, children with a math disorder actually have a coexisting ADHD diagnosis. But there's also a lot of environmental factors that gotta be ruled out when we're discussing a mathematics disorder. Uh, and it's really, it has to be included with any learning disability. Uh, access to education. Um, is it a poor curriculum that we're utilizing, right? Um, uh, did the child not get enough uh, experience with or exposure to math facts throughout his or her life? Um, so the next disability is a specific learning disability with impairment in written expression. Um, and the DSM identifies three deficits that, that in, this, in, in which this can present itself. So spelling is one of them. Uh, grammar and punctuation accuracy is another. And the third is the clarity or organization of written expression. So disorder of written expression is actually the most difficult academic skill for a child to learn. Uh, it incorporates several cognitive processes, uh, visual spatial awareness, organization, motor skills, planning. Um, but it actually, what we know about from the clinical literature is it's the least researched. Um, and we really aren't sure of the exact percent of individuals in the United States who present with a disorder of written expression. Uh, what we do know that a disorder of written expression with no other learning disability is really rare. Typically what we will see is uh, writing and reading will often go hand in hand. That if a child struggles with uh, phonetic awareness, decoding, we're gonna struggle with spelling, which is part of like Alex just mentioned, uh, the DSM, the criteria for a, re a writing disability. The overall prevalence of learning disorders is about 20% of the population that well, experiences some form of difficulties with academic performance, but 6% of the general population meet criteria for a specific learning disorder. So part of what we want to talk about is the importance of a neuropsychological evaluation to assess for a learning disability. Uh, what a neuropsychological evaluation is, is a comprehensive evaluation looking at cognitive ability, uh, academic achievement and details, so looking at all the stages of reading, writing, mathematics, attention, focus, uh, executive functioning skills, organization, planning, problem solving, and then social emotional functioning. Oftentimes, traditional school-based evaluations are insufficient in that uh, they don't have the means to provide the in-depth uh, assessment. Um, and neuropsych eval will really help identify specific areas of weakness as well as areas of strength and what we can harbor as far as 
really develop these skill sets and utilize the child's strengths while working on the areas of weakness. Uh, and also want to try to find information about possible etiological causes. Where is this coming from, right? Uh, is this a comorbid ADHD uh, diagnosis that we really want to address the attention, the focus? Is there an underlying an anxiety disorder that we want to treat as well that can be hindering the success of intervention? All right, so learning to read programs. So when we're working with teaching learning uh, to read, you want to focus on several things. We want to really focus on emotional support and gradually increment the challenges. So we want the child to see success, right? Uh, if we make it extremely difficult at the beginning, the child already struggles with reading, they're just going to feel hopeless and give up. But we know that the greater intensity, so the amount of hours per week and length, the total duration of instruction is important. Um, so if we just do five minutes a day, five days a week, that's 25 minutes, that's okay. But I'd really like to see 30 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day, five days a week to really hit home the skill sets that we're working on. Teacher training and support is very critical. Uh, we we want to make sure that uh, teachers are aware and trained on a variety of programs. And a variety of programs could be, uh, we'll talk a little bit about multi-sensory programs in a minute, like Wilson, Orton Gillingham. Um, and also we want multiple layers of intervention. So there needs to really be constant progress monitoring to see, is the intervention paying off? Are we making gains that we'd expect to make from this intervention? And if not, what do we do to revise it? A multi sensor approach to reading. So these are the programs that I just sort of mentioned. There's a couple big ones, Orton-Gillingham, Wilson, the slant reading program. And these are really involved the use of visual, auditory, and kinesthetic tactile pactolites simultaneously to enhance memory of learning of written language. These links are consistently made between the visual, the language we see, auditory, the language we hear, and the tactile, the language symbols we feel uh, in learning to read and spell. The teachers rely on all three pathways for learning rather than focusing on whole word memory method or tracing method. So they're really focusing on all aspects, auditory, visual, and tactile, instead of just kind of memorization and drill and kill. Um, so there's some interventions for, for reading comprehension. Um, the Wilson and Slant, I think, do a really, will do a really good job at um, intervening at the phonemic level and the fluency level. Um, and then there are some other things that we can do for reading comprehension. So some strategies that we can use to help people with reading comprehension difficulties are building vocabulary, um, finding facts and identifying themes, um, metacognitive strategies like predicting what's gonna happen, um, justifying and confirming meaning in, in the text of what we're reading, um, activating background knowledge, so drawing upon things that we already know to help us kind of consolidate that information when we're taking in new information. Um, comprehension monitoring. So this is um, different for every child. You know, you know, I think one of the strategies that some people some people use is stopping after a paragraph or a page or even a chapter and figure and asking those questions like, "What's going to happen next in the story? What's going on right now?" Um, and then graphic organizers. So this is a visual tool that can help um, individuals organize information where we can like write things down and see it all in this uh, in this visual graph. Remedying uh, learning disabilities for impairment in written expression. So the first aspect is if we notice that it's a fine motor deficit uh, that the child is really struggling, which is the actual aspect of writing, we're going to want the child to get occupational therapy to learn to develop their fine motor skill sets and their graph and motor integration. Um, and in remediating specific learning disabilities with impairment in reading, uh, reading expression uh, for letter formation and spacing, um, graph paper is something that's really helpful. Uh, teacher modeling um, is, is also very helpful. Tracing and writing um, can also be really helpful. And then for the child that we really want to focus on increasing the amount of written output they have, right? Is that the child just provides the bare minimum, um, half a sentence or a sentence at most. We really want to develop kernel sentences. So give a beginning, a prompt for the child to work on using connecting words to connect the kernel. So making compound sentences, teaching the child that then what happened and then they kind of have it in a blank spot so they know where to put the next sentence. Uh, expanding the key points, a lot of use of graphic organizers, again, to teach organization, outlining skills. And then use of the tower strategy. And the tower strategy is an acronym for think. So brainstorm, that's some ideas and determine the focus of the paper. So the first step, obviously, what am I going to write about? 
organize, create an outline, uh, making sure to create examples. Then I start the outline. I have the thought about what I'm doing. I got my outline. Then write, start putting my actual thoughts on the paper, edit, revise it, use a metacognitive strategy, checking it, did I do it correctly? And then rewrite, go back and edit and rewrite it again. And it's a kind of, the last two steps are uh, happen again and again, right? Is that we constantly want to edit, we constantly rewrite until we get the finished product. Another organization or another strategy is the, the please strategy that's really helpful for organizing thoughts, putting it into writing and um, uh, paragraph formation. And, and that's also an acronym uh, that stands for picking or choosing a topic that is, int is of interest to the writer, um, writing down all of the information about that topic. So writing a list, evaluating, um, checking the list to make sure it's complete and organizing that into an outline format. Activate uh, is the next step where we start each paragraph with a topic sentence. Uh, support, expanding and explaining your ideas with those supportive statements. Uh, and then the end is creating a concluding sentence. Uh, getting intervention for mathematics or accommodation for mathematics. Oftentimes we're going to talk a lot about accommodating the child. Um, so we're going to use a calculator during class and test, right? So we wanted the child to know how to saw, uh, uh, attempt to solve the problem, but we don't really care about the nuance of did they calculate it correctly, as long as they can get the right answer extend the time, let the child process the information, go over a little uh, more detail. List steps from multi-step directions, really break down the problem that if it's a four-step problem, really have step one, step two, step three, step four for the child uh, individually. Provide sample problems to see that here's how we're gonna solve the problem, give them one right before it that they know he or she can see how do they attempt it. Um, a big one for homework is modified work with a focus on quality over quantity, right? Have them do the even problems, the odd problems. Then if you ever do 20 problems where they put a lot of effort into the, uh, versus 40 problems where they got overwhelmed and just shut down. And again, supports like graph paper, formula sheets, where they can put one letter in a box and keep things as organized as possible. Now we're going to move on, uh, learning issues in the schools. So this is going to be, when we're talking about intervention in this uh, for, special, uh, for learning disabilities, we can often talk private services, like we mentioned, Wilson, Orton, Gillingham, the multi-sensor approaches. Uh, you could get a math tutor, writing tutor. But a lot of times, we're going to have to get support in the school environment itself. And there's three main laws or acts that provide all the interventions and the accommodation for the children. Education of all the Handicapped Children Act, American with Disabilities Act, Section 504 and Rehabilitation Act in 1973. Section 504, uh, so Section 504 of the American Rehab Act, Rehabilitation Act, this provides the now of access to participation in educational environment based on the child's disability. Um, so essentially, if a child broke their leg, he or she wouldn't be expected to go to the fifth floor, right? Where they, we're gonna still provide the education, but give it at the first floor. A lot of times now what we see 504 plans for is a child who might have a diagnosis of ADHD that we need to accommodate the child, give this child extra time, preferential seating. Uh, the 504 does not require development of a formal individual education plan, but requires development of an educational plan. It, the difference here is that we're not gonna do intervention. We'll talk a little bit about an IP where that's gonna be intervening for the child, where the 504 is accommodating the child. Uh, the, individual, uh, the Individuals with Disability Ed and Education Act um, has a couple different parts that are important. Um, there's the concept of zero reject, which means that every child, regardless of the severity of their disability, must be educated. Um, the second piece uh, is the non-discriminatory evaluation. So all children are entitled to a non-discriminatory evaluation. Uh, and this is really established to protect um, linguistic minorities and cultural minorities from over-representation or identification in special education. Um, and the last piece is free and appropriate education. Um, and what this allows us or parents and families to receive services that are uh, free of charge. Um, so other services that are offered by um, under that are under this um, this act are things like occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language therapy, counseling or social work support, um, physical education, and assistive technology. Least restrictive environment. So this is that we provide the child with the access to assistance in the most the least restrictive environment, the most inclusive classroom peer environment. Now, what that 
means, though, is it's based on the individual child's needs, right? Sometimes the least restrictive environment is going to be the mainstream regular education classroom. Sometimes the least restrictive environment is a therapeutic environment. So it's all based on what the child's needs are and what their level of support and services are. Um, so an IEP is an individualized education program uh, or plan that documents a school district's responsibilities towards an individual child's educational needs. Um, so it's developed by a team. Um, the team is often including, it includes a special education teacher, a regular education teacher, uh, school administrators, and, and the parents. Um, and it is, it's a huge document that consists of specific goals and object objectives for that child, uh, the names of specific individuals who are responsible for reaching those goals. So a speech therapist would be responsible for speech therapy goals, a reading specialist uh, for reading goals, et cetera, and a timeline for completion. Um, so it's a really a way for, for schools to be held accountable for them to monitor the fact, monitor whether or not the child is making progress. Um, the last piece in IEPs allow for due process, which um, allows us to uh, allows families to challenge either an assessment, the identification, or placement of a child. Uh, so the IDEA, the Individual Disability Education Act, there's been several renditions. In 2004, some important changes happened that they really focus on assessment of emotional disabilities in addendum to educational disabilities. Um, and then also the assessment and the identification of learning disabilities changed. Prior, we used what's called a discrepancy model between ability and achievement. So let's just say a score, uh, when we're talking scores, 100 is an average score. So if a child scored 100 on IQ testing, but the reading was a 70, that's 30 points different, then that'd be a significant discrepancy. We're going away from that now and using what the presenting level of academic achievement is commensurate with the, his or her age or ability. So where is this child compared to his or her peer cohort and how is he performing or is she performing? And they also divide a, pro, a program called response to intervention, which we'll go over in a little bit because they change it with 2015. Um, and now we have the Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, what this is, is that there's a multi-system, multi-tiered systems of support. And that used to be called RTI, response to intervention. Essentially what, are, what this is, is that there's a three-tier uh, system of providing support prior to going for an IEP. What would happen is if the school identifies a child at being at risk, that um, child will first receive tier one services. And that's going to be uh, classroom accommodation. So a uh, reading specialist will often work with the classroom teacher to devise some basic strategies that he or she can provide in, the, in her cl classroom environment for this child. Then we progress monitor, uh, do some MAP or AIMS web testing that I'm sure as parents you probably hear all the time about. Is the child still struggling? Okay, then we'll monitor and move the child up to tier two. Tier two is gonna be small group intervention, usually done three to five days a week, 30 minutes a day. Um, and what they'll do is they'll provide additional reading support in a group level. If the child still continues to struggle, they'll go up to tier three, which is gonna be individual support um, uh, three to five days a week. The differential between this and the IEP is that uh, th this multi-tiered system does not provide specific goals or specific interventions. They're gonna use a group level intervention. Uh, so every child that's in this small tier two group is getting the same intervention. Whereas if an IEP, they're really gonna tailor make the intervention, the goals and the accommodations based on what this individual child's needs are. Uh, the standards are set as far as who needs to receive these services. So that might be, what. Uh, that you, we do an AIMS web testing if a child is at the 15th percentile or below, he or she may be eligible for services. Now, part of the problem is, though, the states can set their own standards. In fact, the school districts can set their own standards. So you might have some districts using 15th percentile, some using 20th percentile uh, for who will get need for additional supports. Um, for an IEP, there's several classifications for disabilities, specific learning disability, other health impairment, that is all, if there's a medical condition, uh, ADHD falls under that run, autism spectrum disorder, emotional disability, visual impairment, we could kind of just go over the rest later if we need to. But I really want to spend more time for a question and answers now uh, that you guys may have. 
Okay, well, thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Isaacs, Dr. Stacy. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to start typing them into the Q&A function. If you squiggle your mouse at the top of your screen, it should pop up, or if you're not in windowed mode, it should be somewhere on your Zoom screen. In the meantime, I do have a couple of questions from our pre-webinar survey that might interest all of you. So first off, somebody from our survey wanted to ask, how do I know what is the right treatment for my child or the right plan for my child? There are a lot of options and it's hard to determine what will be best for my kid. Sure, I think it, it all goes back to what are the specific concerns that we present with, right? So let's take reading. So like we mentioned earlier, if the child struggles with the phonics, with the fluency or the letter word identification, we're probably gonna wanna implement a multi-sensory approach to reading. Uh, whereas if it's comprehension based, we really would want to get a comprehensive speech language evaluation to see as an underlying language issue and then really tailor make intervention to address comprehension. Um, and the same goes for math for writing as well, right? If it's going to be uh, word problems that are the biggest uh, challenge for the child, we're going to really focus on those versus it's the basic concepts computation, then we really want to focus on developing underlying skills of mathematics. Well, thank you very much. Um, so someone else from our survey was interested to know, how do I keep my child engaged during virtual learning? Are there any strategies you would recommend for different learning disabilities uh, based on what you've discussed today? Yes, I can actually answer that. Um, there's several points that we wanna talk about for e-learning that we know that are beneficial. Create a distraction place for learning, right? So we wanna make sure that it could be the kitchen table, but I don't want, a million things in the room. I don't want uh, uh, the dog running around. I don't want the kid in the, the bedroom where he could play with his toys, right? So I want as much distractions uh, free as possible. Review the schedule each day, right? So just spend five minutes in the morning going over your, with the child. Hey, here's what it looks like. You know what? At 1030, you're going to be on a Zoom call for literacy. At 11, you're going to be on a Zoom call for math. Uh, then at 10, you have asynchronous that you're going to be on your own. Um, use of timers, uh, ske visual schedules are critical. Really have everything written down that teaching the child that, you know what, we're going to put a uh, timer on your iPad for, uh, one minute before every Zoom meeting happens so we can allure you to go and get ready for the next meeting. Uh, really focus on utilizing breaks effectively, right? Um, so whenever we have any downtime in school, stay off the screen, right? The child is on screen all day, so let the child rest their eyes. Go out for a little walk, get some fresh air, uh, but utilize the breaks effectively. Uh, and then communicate early and often. Talk to the team, right? Um, you're your best advocate for your child. So if you notice that your child is really struggling, not picking up the information in the Zoom meeting, contact the teacher immediately and just say, hey, look, is there ways we could get more one-on-one -on -one support uh, when there's asynchronous, when the teacher's not live with the child? Uh, what other strategies can we put in place? Thank you very much. Um, and then another question from our survey, how do I get a reading plan implemented for my uh, child at their school? So what you want to do is you first have to identify if there's a need for uh, uh, services, right? Um, so it's going to be one or twofold. If it's going to be that the school can identify that the child is below the cutoff or the multi-tier system, the school will automatically put the child in extra reading support. But if we want to go the IEP route, you're going to have to document that there's a learning disability. There's, there's going to, have to say, is there a real reading disability on the table that we need to support the child with? So if you get an outside event intervention, you're going to want to share that with the school. And then the school is going to do some intervention of their own. So they're going to really want to assess to say, does uh, our findings match up with the private findings were? And if so, okay, now we have evidence to indicate that we should provide this child with an IEP or an education plan. And once you have that documentation, you would take that to the school um, and give, I think every person, every school has a different point person that, that starts and had these, heads these processes, but there's often an administrator or case manager or counselor um, that you, that can start the process um, by gathering all the people together to review these documents and, and put together this plan. All righty. Well, that's all that we have from our audience. It seems like there weren't any questions. I guess you guys were so good at uh, presenting that there were absolutely no questions from anybody. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us today. Um, 
If you want to know more about our services and the stuff that we offer at NSPT, you can go to our website. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram. That's at NSPT for Kids. If you want to get in touch with one of our neuropsychologists with a question that you think of just as soon as you log off the call, because it's the only time that it can happen, um, you can email Ask neuro at kidsblossom.com, or you can call the number that you're seeing on screen right now, 224-725-4138. Um, don't worry about remembering any of this. You're going to get it in an email tomorrow either way. If you want to request a free 15-minute consult just to see if maybe your child qualifies for neuropsychological testing or an eval, um, you can go to northshorepediatrictherapy.com slash neuropsych consultation. And in December, we're going to be doing another webinar, this one about managing your child's anxiety disorder. So we're hoping to see you all there. But in the meantime, stay warm, stay healthy. Um, I did just get a question. Will this recording be made available to view at a later date? Absolutely, it will. Um, we are going to start editing this recording right after we log off, and it's going to be available on YouTube by the end of the day tomorrow. You will be receiving an email with a link to that. Um, but with all that said, thank you so much for attending, everybody. Um, I hope you stay healthy and warm and all that good stuff. Uh, and we'll see you next time.